I'm doing today. Hey, why don't we all stand up? Let's give Jesus a big round of applause today. Oh, co oh come on, seriously. I said Jesus a round of applause today. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that Jesus shows up in my life all the time. Amen. Hey, we're going to make some declarations over our lives. If you're a guest with us today, this is not a cult or anything. We just believe in speaking what the Word of God says, not how we feel or what the circumstances say. And when we do, we speak words of life, and life starts showing up in our lives. It's the most amazing thing and principle in the Word of God is that the tongue has the power of life and death. And so I want to encourage you to say these things out loud with me together. Y'all ready? God is who He says He is. God will do what He says He will do. I am who God says I am. I can do all things through Christ. God's Word is truth. God's Word is alive and active in me. And now because of what Christ has done, I'm highly favored, greatly blessed, and deeply loved. Do you believe that today? Amen. Let me pray over you today. Father, I pray that as we step into the next few minutes, God, that you would speak life to every one of us today. Lord, we've come today to have an encounter with you, to allow your Holy Spirit to do something fresh in all of our lives. So we just ask right now, Father, that you you would speak life to us as we open up our hearts to you. Lord, we, we haven't come um, out of obligation. We haven't come because we have to be here. God, we've come because we want to experience, God, your love afresh and anew in our lives. So, God, I thank you today for every person that is here, and I pray that you would do something amazing in each and every one of our lives today, God. It's in Christ's wonderful name. God's children said, amen. You may be seated. Why don't you give somebody a high five on your way down? All right. If you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John, John chapter 13, verse 35. I wanted to start off today by reading a testimony, and one of the things that we are constantly encouraging you to do is to recognize that found people find people, meaning when we became found, that now the opportunity in our laps to actually help find other people who do not know and have not experienced the love and hope of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing how many people that you come in contact with that are wonderful, amazing people or kind of grouchy and grimy people that really need the love and hope that's found in Christ Jesus. And sometimes just a simple invitation or the repetitiveness of an invitation will actually bring great change in their life. And, and this is from Sabrina Emmert and and she shared this with us. And by the way, if you ever have a testimony that you would love to share, we'd love for you to share that with us. But she, she wrote this. Jenna Brown kept texting me, my dad, and our grandmother to come to the Christmas production. Every week for four weeks, she would send out a group text letting us know the date and time of the production. I ignored her text every time. Tyler and I always used Sundays as our sleep-in days, so we never really thought much about going to church. We had been a couple of times before but never consistently. On the Sunday morning of the production, I woke up without setting an alarm at 8 o'clock. Laying in bed, I heard something inside of me saying that I was awakened for a reason, that we need to go to church. So I woke up Tyler against his will and Kennedy. We all got dressed, and I texted Jenna asking her if she would save a spot for Tyler and I. We got there, got Kennedy into the toddler room, and took our seats, and from that day forward, my life was changed. I knew that Amarillo Fellowship was the place that I wanted every Sunday. I knew that I wanted to tell everyone about a, the powerful experience I had that day, and I now look forward to going to church. I felt the presence of God that I've never paid attention to before. Tyler and I knew that we wanted to get involved, and God spoke to us and told us that it was time for us to start the growth track. It just so happened that the next week was step one, so we are both part of the dream team today, and it's Sundays are the best day of the week. Thank you, Sabrina. Isn't that awesome? They're now serving on the dream team. One of them is involved in the children's area. One of them is involved in the worship area. And listen, we want to encourage you to go through the growth track to begin to understand your purpose and the purpose that we have here as a church. And I promise you, it will radically change your life forever. And you never know who you invite might actually come, and it might radically change their life forever. All right? So, hey, I want to begin a new series today called Irresistible Love. And I want to talk about making Christianity irresistible once again. It's based on a book by Andy Stanley. In fact, I want to encourage you to read it. It's, it's an incredible read. Uh, just so you know, it's going to jack with your theology a little bit. And, and 
And by the way, all of us have a theology. All of us have a, a belief or an understanding about God. Um, some of them, we're growing in them, but we're on the right path. Sometimes it's a, it's a wrong perspective about God. And so we need to make sure that we're constantly learning more and developing our understanding about who God is. So I want to begin this series and again, talk about making Christianity irresistible again. Now, when you think of the word irresistible, what do you typically think of? I, I was thinking this week about some things that I think are irresistible, like puppies. Now, some of you that, oh, yeah, puppies are irresistible. Some of you are like, no, that's not irresistible. We have a picture. Yeah, here it is right here. Me and and Jasper and Blaze are our two dogs. They're brothers. And, and puppies are irresistible. One of the amazing things that I've discovered about Pam and I is we were kind of like an adoption agency for a long time about dogs, meaning we would get dogs, have them for a while, recognize they weren't for us, so then we would find them a good home. But this time we've actually decided that, hey, maybe we can actually do this. So we've got these two incredible puppies. And it's pretty cool because whenever we go out in public, people are always attracted to our puppies. If you've ever carried your puppies out in public, you know that people who would never say a word to you, people who would never look at you or even acknowledge you, will go out of their way to come over and ask you all kinds of questions about your dog. What kind of a dog is it? How old is it? How much does it weigh? What kind of food does it eat? Does it know any tricks? I mean, it's just on and on, the amazing things that they'll ask you. So puppies are one of those things that are irresistible. Another one, babies. Babies are irresistible. You always want to go up, pinch their cheeks. You always want to go up and kind of pat them and see them, and especially other people's babies. In, in fact, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but in about four weeks, I'm going to be a grandpa. And I'm excited about becoming a papa. Four weeks away is a countdown. Just so you know, he, he's going, Pastor Richard, you always use that in a sermon illustration. I'm going to be using it until Jesus comes, so you might as well just get used to it. Because I'm excited about being a grandpa. It's my first. Now, I've got some friends that have been grandpas for a long time, and they've been saying, man, it's the most amazing thing in the world. In fact, Rich is sitting here, here on the front. I think he's got 27 grandchildren already. And he and I are the same age, and he's always like, man, it's amazing. You're going to love it. So babies, babies are irresistible. Bargains are irresistible. I'm going to find something that you're irresistible to. In fact, for some of you, when you hear there's a sale, you can't wait to show up. In fact, you have saved so much money this year, you're going broke. Seriously. And, and, and we, we love a bargain. In fact, this jacket that I'm wearing today, it's a, I wanted to wear it today because I got this jacket over 80% off yesterday. I love me a good bargain. And, and this one is a little bit kind of um, over the edge, but the padding of pregnant women's ba bellies. Some of you don't have any understanding of personal space, so you walk up to almost every woman that's pregnant going, oh, it's just so cute, it's just so amazing, and you find that kind of irresistible. But here's the thing that I want to talk about today. People that love us, we find irresistible. Amen. You get somebody in your life that loves you, that's kind to you, that's sweet to you, that loves you in your best times, that loves you in your worst times, and we find that incredibly irresistible. And what I would like to see related to Christianity is for Christianity to become irresistible once again. Listen, when the church was born, when Christianity was born, it was so attractive that even though the church was persecuted by the religious leaders of the day, let's call it the temple, and the Roman government, let's call it the empire, even though it was sandwiched between those two things, it not only survived, it actually thrived and impacted and changed the world. And my question is today is, how did that happen? And can it happen again today? Because I think if you and I look around, it's pretty easy for us to recognize that we live in a culture that is anti-Christianity. And the reason is a lot of times it's because they're just seeing us and they're not seeing Christ in us. And what we need to recognize is that we were not designed to be like the rest of the world. The Bible says that we are a peculiar people. Now that doesn't mean weird, all right? I've, I've watched church for long enough to recognize that some people think peculiar people is that you have to do something weird. You have to wear outdated clothing. You can't wear makeup. You have to act a certain way that's just kind of funky and jacked up. But what it means is that we are different than the rest of the world. When the world hates us, we can love them back. When the world is unkind to us, we can be kind back. 
All right, are you all hearing me today? That when the world is not nice to us, we can be nice back towards them. When our boss is not showing us the proper favor that he should be showing us, we can still show favor back to him. We don't have to let the world decide our actions. So it not only thrived, survived, but it actually thrived and changed the world. And listen, I'm not interested in just Christianity becoming irresistible to the world. I would like to see Christianity become irresistible to you and I again. Where Christianity is not a have to. Where showing up on Sundays is not a have to. Where reading the Bible is not a have to. Where loving people that seem unlovable is not a have to. And that will only happen as we begin to recognize that living for Jesus is the greatest thing in the world. That Christianity is the most amazing thing in the world. When Pam was talking today about all that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, the mindset that we typically have is is about salvation. It's fire insurance. I'm now going to heaven, so let me just kind of hold on until Jesus comes. We don't recognize the inheritance that we actually have in Christ Jesus. The preservation, the amazing things that God wants to do in us and through our lives. But in order for you and I to make Christianity irresistible, we have to stop mixing the old and the new covenant. We have to stop mixing law and grace. And many times we don't recognize when we are mixing law and grace because we are more grace-based than the people that raised us. Or maybe we're more grace-based than the church we grew up in or the pastors that taught us. So a lot of times we don't recognize when we're walking in the old and the new covenant. But we need to move away from the old covenant and embrace the new covenant and truly become followers of Jesus Christ. You understand that's what Christianity is, right? That we are disciples We are followers of Jesus Christ, that we are following after Jesus. So what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? By the way, today I'm going to be talking and kind of laying a little bit of groundwork for this series. And I'm going to be teaching a little theology today. And you're going to have to kind of sit up to the big boy table and chew on some stuff that might be a little bit more challenging for us to wrap our minds around that we can actually make Christianity irresistible once again. So again, how do we know for a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, here's what the Bible says in John 13. This is Jesus talking, and he's saying this. By this, by the thing we're going to look at at the end, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Here's the by this, if you love one another. Let me say it again. By this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So the proof that I am a follower of Jesus Christ is by the love that I have for other people. I think when I show a verse like this, I think most people would nod in agreement and say, yes, that's right. But let me ask you this question. How do you define believers? When you look at people, what what is it that you decide is the litmus test of whether or not that person is a follower of Jesus Christ? Is it their obedience to everything in the Bible? Is it if they show up to church on Sunday? Is it is it the way that they dress? Is it by the way that they may live their life perfectly? Now, all those things are good and important, but the litmus test for us understanding who followers of Jesus Christ are are by the love, is by the love that we have for one another. So here's the question that I get asked from time to time. Pastor Richie, is blank a sin? Is blank a sin? You know, fill in the blank. And to be quite honest with you, I've asked that question myself quite a few times. In fact, you probably have too. Because see, I was taught growing up that sin offends God, so I should avoid sinning in order to avoid offending God. Which is true, but I always wasn't sure where the fun ended and the sin began. Hence the question, is blank a sin? And just so you know, it is human nature to want to know exactly where the okay and the not okay lines are. So that we can snuggle up just as close as we possibly can to the not okay line without actually not being okay. Right? I didn't want to be guilty of sin, but man, I sure as heck didn't want to miss out on anything that wasn't off limits. 
That's why we ask the question, is blank a sin? Or what does the Bible say about blank? See, the way that I was raised in church was sin avoidance was our guiding light. It, it wasn't about a relationship. Now, they would say it was, but it was constantly focused on don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And we were constantly allowing sin avoidance to be our guiding light. If I wasn't breaking a God rule, it was well with my soul. And I was free to pray and communicate with God, and he would hear and hopefully answer my prayers. And here's what I didn't recognize, and I think we a lot of times don't recognize, is that the focus of the relationship was only vertical. It was about me and my relationship with God. In fact, I was, more, I was far more concerned about how my behavior affected my standing with God than I was about how my behavior affected anybody else. And we see this in the church today, people that are mean and ugly trying to get people to do the right thing, thinking that the means justifies the end. So after all, the Bible says that pleasing God is more important than pleasing people, right? Which meant that if I sinned against you and asked God to forgive me, everything was good between God and me, even if things weren't good between you and me. And I could have a clear conscience before God while avoiding you in the grocery store right? This vertical only focus made the assumption that God's primary concern was how my behavior affected him. In this way of thinking, God is personally offended by sin because it's contrary to his nature and to his holiness. And listen, while it's true, it created in me a vertical focus only where I wondered all the time what God thought about my behavior. Since we can't see God, we can't see his face, facial expressions, or his body language, it always left us wondering and guessing, thus the question, what is and what is not sin? Are y'all picking up what I'm laying down today? Y'all tracking what I'm saying, going, yeah, I'm there, Pastor Richie. Listen, to be quite honest, it's actually quite hypocritical because our questions aren't focused on how our sin affects God, but how our sin affects us. I was far more concerned about how my sin would affect me than I was about how my sin would affect God. And besides that, asking how close to sin you can actually get without sinning is the same thing as asking how far away from God can I get without actually losing contact. And it is certainly not the approach that we want to take as followers of Jesus Christ. It seems like we think Christianity is very resistible, that it's a have to that it's a drudgery, that it's the bad news of Jesus Christ rather than the good news. Just so you know, there's another approach to this vertical-focused relationship. In fact, instead of seeing how low you can go, there are some people who want to see how high they can get. Not that kind of high. But they want to see a deeper, more intimate relationship with God. And, and so they ask a different set of questions, much vir more virtuous questions. They ask questions like, how can I get closer to God? How can I know God more intimately? And while they may or may not have recognized it, these questions are focused on the same priority of a vertical relationship only. Because listen to this, while seeking a deeper relationship with God is awesome, the intimacy sought is not for God, but for the seeker. People that are seeking a deeper experience with God are seeking something for themselves, which is fine, Except people who are looking for ways to get closer to God can be just as self-absorbed as those who wonder how far they can go and not drift too far away. And just so you know, I've tried to play on both of those playgrounds. I have. I've lived on both sides of the fence looking for loopholes in my relationships on the teaching of Jesus Christ in order to have my way without wandering too far away. And the other one led me to seek a deeper relationship with God, but it was still all about me. In fact, here's what it produced in me. The more disciplined I became in following Jesus, the more intolerant and judgmental I became of other people who were not where I was. So whether you're looking for a loophole in your relationship with Jesus or trying to be focused on becoming more disciplined to go deeper with God, we think it's obeying the law that proves that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And what we don't recognize is we end up mixing the old and the new covenants. 
And it causes us to have a vertical focus only in our faith in Jesus, which causes us to think that Christianity is all about me. We become very self-absorbed. So, if that's the case, what's the alternative? Going horizontal? Yeah, great guess. In fact, where did I come up with that? From today's verse. Again, John chapter 13 says this. By this, by this, this is how we're going to know if we're following after Jesus. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, it's important to note that when Jesus came to this earth, he did not come to abolish the old covenant and the law. He came to fulfill it. Jesus came as the hinge pinch between the old covenant and the new covenant. But he did not come to bring old covenant 2.0. He didn't come to add to the old covenant. He came to abolish it, to fulfill it, so that we could step into the new covenant. He was ushering in something brand new. Which is why he was in constant conflict with the religious leaders of his day. Because all of his teachers were giving people a heads up. Something new is coming your way. We're about ready to change everything that you've ever thought or believed. It's no longer going to be their obedience to the commandments that would prove their love for God. It was going to be their love for other people that would be the true test of their love for God. So it's amazing when you start reading the scriptures and start understanding things. In fact, when Jesus taught this in the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, he said this. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Now, as modern-day people in church, we don't really have an understanding of what this actually is all implying. Because many of us grew up in church where there were altars in the front, and we would have altar call services at the end. Y'all remember those? Anybody show of hands remember altar call services? Okay, a few of us. There was these altars that would be at the front, and we'd come down, and we would cry, and snot would be going everywhere, and we'd tell God, we're never doing that again until we got out in the parking lot, and then we'd do it again, and all, all this time. So when we think of altar, that's what we think of. We think of, if I came forward, and, and I remember, oh, yeah, sister so-and-so has something against me. I'll just leave my gift at the altar, my prayer at the altar. I'll walk back a few seats, and I'll say, hey, we need to get this thing right. Okay, I'm I'm sorry that this happened. But in Jesus' day, people only visited the temple once or twice a year. The lines were long. They actually had to wait in line to actually get in. And many would travel for days to get there. So for them to leave their gift at the altar, travel back sometimes um, for days back home to get something right with someone who might be offended to them, it seemed crazy. But listen, This is what Jesus said. And it turns out this is actually what he meant. This was brand new. Jesus was moving our love for God being expressed through our obedience to our love for God being expressed by us loving others. It was a total shift. It was a total paradigm shift in people's thinking. If you fast forward 17 chapters to Matthew chapter 22, we see the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. They're taking shots at Jesus. They're trying to trick him with questions. They're trying to trip him up to get the people to turn against him because suddenly this Jesus movement has become really popular where people are beginning to understand that it's about our love for one another, not following all the rules and regulations. And so... They're they're taking shots at him. One of them, they ask him an IRS question. He said, show me a coin. He said, whose whose insignia is on it? Caesar. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, to God the things that are God. Next came the Sadducees, and they, they told him a parable about the afterlife. And just so you know, they didn't believe in the afterlife. That's why the Sadducees were sad, you see. All right. So Jesus explained some other stuff to them. So Finally, the the Pharisees get together and they send a lawyer. Now, how many of you know when you have to go after a lawyer, you're getting serious now, right? You've tried every other means, but they, they brought in a lawyer. And here's what it says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. It says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Now, just so you know, this lawyer is not coming there because he just loves Jesus, 
He's not coming there because he, he, he loves what Jesus has been teaching and he's so excited about this and he's learning stuff. And so, hey, I want to ask you a question. He's there to stump the unstumpable teacher from Nazareth. He's, he's there to, to build up his own resume. And so here's what he says. He asked him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, just so you know, this is not a hard question because every Jewish boy and girl was taught this from a very early age, what the greatest commandment was. And we aren't actually sure where the lawyer was going with this. Perhaps he had a follow-up question that he was going to use to try to trick Jesus. But Jesus went in and said, and Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Yes, it was. Rabbis had been saying that for years. But Jesus didn't stop there. He continued on. And the second is like it. Which I'm sure the lawyer said, wait, the second is like it? I only asked for the greatest commandment, not the greatest commandments. And I bet Jesus held up his hand like, hey, wait, I'm not finished. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's something that you may not know, but this is the first time that these two Old Testament verses and statements had been combined in this way. The first statement made its debut in Deuteronomy, and the second one in Leviticus. But this formula was original and unique with Jesus. This was new. In fact, most commentators believe that Jesus' point was there are actually two greatest commandments because of the statement, is like it. In fact, the second commandment wasn't second in importance. It was only second in sequence. But it was as equally great and as important as the first one. And according to Jesus, all the, their Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled through those two commandments. Well, how do you know that? In the next verse, here's how Jesus said it. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Just so you know, the first century Jewish people called all of their Old Testament scripture, all the law and the prophets. So according to Jesus, all the Old Testament teachings could be summarized by those two commands. These two commands complete and bring fulfillment to all Old Testament scripture. See, because I think that when I start talking about how it's our love for one another that proves that we're a follower of Jesus Christ, not our obedience, some of you think, oh, cool, I don't have to obey. That's not what it's saying. Because if I am unforgiving towards people when God asks me to forgive, am I loving my neighbor as myself? When I'm not showing kindness to people who are not very kind towards me, am I loving my neighbor as myself? All the law and the prophets are summarized in these two scriptures. But listen, if you ask first century Jews what it looked like to love God, they would say, by obeying God. But Jesus established a new answer to the loving God question. His answer was love your neighbor. His point was unmistakable. Love for God was best demonstrated and authenticated by our love for one another. This horizontal expression of love is the thing that made the vertical expression of love actually work. It's not just a vertical relationship anymore. It's a horizontal relationship that proves my vertical relationship with God. Is this making sense today? And I'm telling you that if we'll begin to grasp this, it'll make Christianity irresistible again. It's what first century Christians understood and it made Christianity so irresistible that even though they were persecuted, even though the people had to start thinking differently than they'd ever thought before, it changed and impacted the world. So some of you may be asking, but Pastor Richie, it's so hard to love some people. I would agree. There are some people that if I'm going to have to operate out of my own love and my own ability to love people, I would say it's incredibly difficult. But that's why we spend so much time here at Amarillo Fellowship talking about how perfectly and how unconditionally God loves you. Because when you get that and the love of God is on the inside of you, the love of God can't help but flow out of you. In fact, one of the ways that I recognize when I have forgotten how perfectly God loves me, which by the way, we can all forget about like that, is by the fact that I am being unloving towards other people. People begin to frustrate me. People begin to drive me nuts. Y'all with me? Got a few of those people in your life too? 
And suddenly I have to start recognizing, wait a second, wait a second. God, thank you that you love me. Do you, do you remember how in love with Jesus you felt the day you gave your life to Christ? Or you rededicated your life, or God showed up in a supernatural way and did a miracle in your life. He restored your marriage, he brought healing, there was a financial breakthrough, and suddenly you just felt the love of God. We should feel that every day. I'm not talking about being driven by our emotions, but I'm talking about getting up every morning and getting fresh manna from God, saying, God, I thank you today that you love me unconditionally. God, I thank you that even though I've missed the mark and I've blown it and I've said some things I shouldn't have said and I've done some things that I shouldn't have done, God, it's never, ever, ever changed your love for me. It's one of the reasons why when we come into a worship service and we start singing about the goodness of God, sometimes, man, I'm telling you, I get so touched by the presence of God. And the reason is, is I'm reminding myself how perfectly God loves me. And it's being filled with God's love that empowers me to give God's love away. So again, sometimes there's just some people that are challenged to love. The other question you might ask is, Pastor Richie, I want people to love me. I, I want to I be loved by people. Well, that's kind of the point. You see, we want to create a culture where you and I loving each other is the norm. It's not the exception, it's the norm. Where our love for others who are followers of Jesus Christ and our love for others who are not followers of Jesus Christ becomes so irresistible that people who don't look like us, act like us, or think like us are actually attracted to us because of the irresistible love of God that's flowing through us. This past week in our small group, I told the 10 people in our small group that if 11 disciples could turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ, I think that we could do the same. I had some people ask me, really, seriously? I said, absolutely. In, in fact, this morning, this message is for everybody, but everybody may not buy into this, but just so you know, we don't have to have you buy into it for us to turn the world upside down. If one of us will just make the choice, if two of us, if five of us, if 10 of us, 15, 20, pick the number, we'll just say, I don't care what everyone else is gonna do. I'm gonna be so filled with the love of God, I'm gonna start loving people that I come in contact with. You can change the world in which you live in. You can change your sphere of influence, and not only that, you'll start changing the sphere of influence elsewhere. Some of you go into places of work and it's so ungodly, you hate it so much, and you keep waiting for someone else to change it, why don't you decide to point yourself as a committee of one? I'm gonna let the love of God flow through me. I'm gonna change the environment in which I live in. Most life-changing thing in the world. While we can't always make the choice for others to love others, we can make the choice for us. We can simply choose to rise above our feelings. We can simply choose to rise above our emotions in the moment and allow the love of God to flow through us. So how do we allow God's love to flow through us? by going out of our way to love on other people and serve other people. Listen, it's easy to give lip service to love. Oh yeah, yeah, Pastor Richie, we love everyone. We do. Listen, love is in love until you start moving out in love as a verb. Love the feeling is awesome. I love being in love with my wife, which by the way, those are super hot boots by the way today, babe. I love being in love with my wife. I do. But I have to be honest with you, there's some times when we are not on the same page and we've got some challenge and sometimes the feelings of love aren't there. And you know what I've discovered? That love the feeling is a product of love the verb. That when I choose to love her and serve her, but despite how I feel, love the feeling starts showing up in my life and it starts changing everything. Listen, that's why we ask you to go through the growth track so that you can know who we are as a church to understand that we have a purpose to, to populate heaven and plunder hell. We're, we're, we don't want to live in an area where people don't know the good news of Jesus Christ. We want to keep reaching out until all are saved. We want to make sure that we're doing this until all are saved. Come on, y'all. Listen, there's some people who haven't discovered the love and hope of Jesus Christ. And as long as that is happening, we've got to do more. We've got to be more. Listen, it's not about doing, doing, doing to prove to God that we love him. It's about doing because of what he's done in our hearts and lives. 
So we go through the growth track. Listen, you need to get through the growth track. You need to discover who we are. You need to discover the plan and purpose that God has for your life. You need to get into a small group. The reason why some of you can't do this is because you have so much hurt and pain in your life that you need to get into a small group and allow some healing to take place. You need some restoration to take place in your life. I'm telling you, James, and we need to serve people that can't serve themselves. This past week in our small group, somebody was sharing a story about their mother, and their mother had gotten hurt. I guess a gate had blown over on her or something, and she was in the hospital. And she said that I was in the hospital, and her small group came up there and said, man, we love you, and we're praying for you. How many of you know that's kind of easy to do sometimes? We love you, and we're praying for you. God bless you. See you later. They not only did that, they began serving her. They began taking meals to her, and she said that was an amazing expression of the love of Jesus Christ in their life, simply by serving people. This past week on Tuesday night, went up to the hospital, and many of you know that Nathan Miller was tragically killed in a car accident this past week. Went up to the hospital, and we were with his wife, and as we were there, I mean, literally, people are showing up from our church all over. They're loving on Gabby and loving on the extended family, telling them how much we love them. Many of you have written in and said, man, what can we do? What can we give? You've, you've given money to help the family. That's what I'm talking about. It's not about lip service anymore. It's about us extending the love and hope of Jesus Christ to people who need to experience the love and hope of Jesus Christ. By this, Jesus said, everyone will know you're my disciple if you love one another. Listen, as we embark on this series, I want to say it again. This is for everybody, but everybody may not go with us, but it doesn't matter. Because there's going to be a group of people, and I pray it's everybody, but there's going to be a group of people that are going to go, you know what, I'm going to change some things about me. I'm going I'm to get involved. I'm going to start serving people. I'm going to start loving on people. I'm going to allow the gift that God has put in me flow out of me and touch people's hearts and lives. And I'm telling you, you'll make a difference for eternity. So I want to pray over you today. I'm going to ask you just to bow your head and close your eyes, if you would. Father, I just pray right now for every person that's here today. God, that every one of us could receive the love of God. Lord, I pray for people that are here this morning that their love has grown cold. They've gone through the motions of church. They, they, they sit in a pew week after week, never allowing your Holy Spirit to bring life change to them. And I pray today, God, that you'd speak to their heart today and do something fresh in every one of their lives that we'd get a fresh revelation of how amazing your grace and your love they are for us today. And what you did so that we might have life, abundant life, here and now and eternal life with you in heaven. So thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. God, and I pray that you would change our hearts and lives, that we would make a decision that we're going to serve others. We're going to love on others. We're going to pour into other people. That we're not going to just let it stop with us that we're going to allow the contagious good news of Jesus Christ to get inside, that's inside of us to get out of us and start changing the society in which we live in. We're not waiting for other people anymore. We're going to appoint ourselves to be a committee of one to bring about life change. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, one of the most important things that you can ever do to begin what I'm talking about today is by opening up your heart and life to Jesus and to receive him into your heart and life. And if you're here today and you're saying, Pastor Richie, I've never given my life to Christ, never made that decision, but man, today I'd like to make that decision to surrender my heart and life to God. Or maybe you're here and you're saying, Pastor Richie, I've, I've, I've made that decision, but I recognize today I'm not where I need to be. I've allowed some things to come between me and God, and today I'd like to rededicate my heart and life. So as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, this is a, a personal moment between you and God. In just a moment, I'm going to have you lift your hand when I count to three, but until then, I want you just to say, God, where am I at? What do I need to do? And allow God to speak to your heart and life today. So I'm going to count to three. If you need Jesus for the very first time, or you'd like to rededicate your life, just slip your hand up. Hold it up high. We're going to pray with you right there at your seats. One, two, three. Slip it up. Yes, God bless you. 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 Way back here. God bless you right back here. Anybody else? God's dealing with your heart. Yes, God bless you, young man. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? I'm going to look across the audience one more time. If you need Jesus in your heart and life, pray along with these ten 
saying, that's me, Pastor Richie, right where you're at. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to invite everyone here today just to pray out loud with me. Just say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. And thank you for dying on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you died and that you rose again, that I might have life, abundant life, and eternal life. So thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for me. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.